Hi everyone. This is Caroline Griffin, Riot's Events and Operations Manager. We are super excited to have you here today for the SAS Lunch and Learn with Brad Cleanse. Um, Brad has been a longtime supporter of Riot, him and the entire SAS ecosystems, and he's given several Lunch and Learns, but this topic we have not heard before, so we're super excited to have him here today. Just a couple of quick notes before we get started. This will be recorded and added to Riot's YouTube channel, so be on the lookout for that. If you have any questions throughout the event, Brad has agreed to pause a couple times throughout his presentation. Um, feel free to put your questions into the chat box, or if you're comfortable, you can also unmute yourself and ask a question to Brad personally. Um, either way works, so whatever you're most comfortable with. But without further ado, I will give it away to Brad. Thank you, Brad, for being with us today. Yeah, thank you, Caroline. Thanks. <laughs> Appreciate it. Uh, hi there. I'm uh, Brad Cleanse. I work at SAS um, in our IoT division. Uh, maybe I've met some of you who are pretty active in Riot and like to do all the different events, uh, like the developer days. We had something there uh, and then coming up for the, uh, the All Things Open uh, conference and everything. Um, like I said, we have a separate division at SAS. We started up a few years ago specifically focusing on IoT, um, and I work in that division. And what I, my job title is analytic architect. And basically what I do is SAS is a, you know, an analytics company and I work with different customers and, uh, and some of our partners, integration partners and everything to look at the business problems that they're trying to solve. Uh, and then what data they're getting through their IoT devices and what analytics we can apply that to solve the different problems uh, that they're looking for. Um, what is going to go through today was a project we put together earlier this year for um, almost really kind of as a, a demonstration project and uh, for sustainability, environmental sustainability initiative that we have at SAS, um, working with uh, beehives, uh, honey beehives and putting sensors on them. So it's a good, it's a good um, example of all the different technologies uh, that we use. Um, and then that's also an interesting topic. So I'm going to go through uh, go through this a, a little bit. I've got um, a little bit of uh, slides here showing the um, kind of what the project is and how we put it together. And then I'll do a, a demo in there. Uh, like Caroline was saying, um, glad to take questions. I like it, you know, doing these things informally. Uh, so um, I'm not watching the chat window. So Caroline will have to relay those for me. But uh, as we get going, we'll do that. But so this project, uh, the way we got going with it is we wanted to show both not only just what we do in IoT, uh, but how we use uh, our artificial intelligence algorithms. And we've got a couple people on our team here who are uh, beekeepers, and we have beehives uh, out at the SAS campus uh, there in Cary. Um, and so by having those hives there and some of our beekeepers and they know all the different technologies available, they had different questions about, you know, basically understanding the health of the beehives because the bees are going through a lot of stress. Uh, you've probably seen some articles uh, about them, uh, the different stresses that the beehives are having and going and, you know, dying off and things of that aspect. So, um, and when you're, you really don't, you know, you don't monitor beehives that closely, you know, they're just sitting out in a field by themselves lots of times, and they'll be just out there for days and days and days just sitting there. So the, the beekeepers really don't have a, a real good grasp on what's all going on. And even if you were there, it's inside the beehive is where most of the activity is, and you're not looking in there all the time. So we, we wanted to uh, capture some of the different things like, you know, as they're coming and going, how much activity they have and the behavior, um, different behavior patterns. I'll talk about those and, um, and, and then some of the different techniques that we use. So those were some of the objectives. Um, now the IoT aspect of the project is putting in the sensors out there. And we're, these are out at the beehives. You see some pictures uh, there. We've got a, an equipment enclosure. Uh, where we put a gateway out there, but we've got sensors, you know, our traditional sensors of uh, doing things like weight and temperature and humidity. Um, but then the, the acoustics of the buzzing of the bees tells you a lot as well, uh, we found out. And then also just being able to watch and monitor the bees coming and going uh, through computer vision is another aspect that we, uh, that we tackled. 
Now, um, when we put together a, a project like this, um, we have a frame, framework that we call the analytic life cycle. Um, and what the analytic life cycle is, is it's where you get the data. Um, lots of times, you know, traditionally it would go into a, a data storage, uh, you know, some kind of data storage um, facility. Uh, then based on that, all that historical data you have, we create analytic models and develop those and they find they find some of those different interesting aspects that I'll talk about in a little bit. The analytic results are then usually what we end up showing because the raw data itself can be, um, you know, not that interesting or, you know, you can't interpret it. So we use the analytics to help interpret it and to understand the details of what's going on. Now, the, the thing that we've added in the last few years and that especially applies to IRT is we don't want to just work on historical data. We want to work on the real time data because um, we've got those sensors feeding data in real time. So we'll uh, so that's when we put in the bottom half of this uh, with the streaming analytics engine. Uh, and I, this project has both and I'll, I'll show you both in action there. But this is the framework that we use. Um, another interesting aspect of this project from IT perspective is the edge component. Uh, most a lot of different artificial intelligence uh, projects that you hear of are all, all happen in the cloud. All the data goes up to the cloud. Um, that's where the algorithms run. That's where it produces the results. But with IoT, as we've seen with all our projects, is there's a physical aspect to it. And the physical aspect is the sensors out there at, at the location. So we've got things like the, you know, the cameras, uh, microphones, the scales, the humidity gauges. Um, and then another aspect maybe some of you all have um, encountered is what we call edge computing, where you put a gateway, uh, an IoT gateway, near where the data sensors are um, and process that. And we did that in this project. And the, the reasoning being that a lot of, when you, especially when you get to the temperature, I'm sorry, the, the, the audio and the video, um, that produces a lot of data, but here you are out in a field and how are you going to, how would you get that data back to the cloud in any kind of cost efficient manner? And the answer is you, you it wouldn't, you couldn't. Um, and so instead of taking the video and audio and sending it to the cloud, instead we take the analytics that we have on the cloud and bring them down to the gateway where the, um, where the sensors are and when we process it right there, then we're only sending the, um, the results back. So um, in the middle here, you see the uh, enclosure where we've got the a, a gateway in there. And because we're doing computer vision, we're also, it's a gateway that's got a GPU in there um, to, to run that. Uh, there is a little local network, but then it has a, a, a cellular connection to go up to the, the wide area network. Um, and then it uses software like our SAS event stream processing and Python uh, running out there. And then on the far right is just something that's a little bit specific to us uh, for our implementation on the SAS network is we, we didn't want to hook it right back straight into our cloud. Uh, instead, we put a, a DMZ out there and had a server that ran in that DMZ to help us manage the firewall protections uh, between uh, the edge and the cloud. You may not need that for your implementation, but it's something that our IT group wanted to do for ours. So um, I'm going to go ahead and show you uh, some of the screens. Um, as I mentioned, if, if you've got any questions about kind of what the overview of the project is, be glad to take them now as I'm getting that set up. Hey, Brad, I currently don't see any questions. As a reminder, um, everyone is welcome to unmute yourself and ask questions or use the chat box. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no problem. Okay, oh, so. Hi, I have a question. Yeah, sure. So I'm, I'm Lee Atkinson. Um, from Meanstride Technology, but I also represent the Alamance Makers um, Guild Microelectronics Group. And Excellent. while my company has been, um, I guess, at least monitoring and trying to be as much involved in IoT and all the various aspects as possible over the last few years, um, I'm slowly introducing this into um, our microcontroller group. And our group this summer, because of COVID and everything, has been crying out to do a project because every year we do one for the Maker mm -hmm. Fair. This year we had no Maker Fair and mm -hmm. we're a very active group. We try to 
usually choose a project which is fairly substantial from a community standpoint. And I won't go into what we've done in the past, but it has been usually pretty notable. So the guys in my group, uh, I, I heard about this uh, project uh, through a, a, a friend in, in Hickory, uh, Robert Wallace, and he was telling me that mm -hmm. he knew someone who was connected to SAS that was doing this, but when he tried to follow up, he didn't get all the details. And I, I was trying to find out about it because when I told my group, they were ecstatic. They said, we need to do this project. They said, <laughs> if nothing else, for a learning process. Okay. But they were highly interested in the state of what was going on or what needs to be done as well, maybe just from a justification standpoint, or would mm -hmm. be interested in plugging into any other effort because there's all these different aspects. Is the okay, whole definitely. end to end, right? From the end point to the gateway to the presentation of the data on, on the cloud, the whole thing. But we would like to, if we contributed, we'd like to be able to contribute something positive. So yeah, yeah. anyway, okay, just excellent. introducing our group and saying, um, we really don't know what the state of development is or where we mm -hmm. can plug in or how we could assist or something like that. Okay, okay, yeah, definitely. Well, obviously, yeah, just send me a message. Um, uh, and, uh, and I can connect you up. We've got, like I said, we've got a couple of beekeepers uh, at SAS who are part of the project. And they, they attend a lot of the, the beekeeping, uh, you know, meetings and, and everything like that. So they're, they're pretty well connected with some of the, the other people, especially in North Carolina on that. So, yeah, most definitely. Okay. Well, and you'll, you'll kind of see some of the, the aspects of this. And I'll, that'll remind me to talk about how to get started on something like this, too. All right. Thank um, you. So, yeah, thank you. So what I'm showing you right now, this is the, um, uh, the computer vision part of the, uh, of the project. And this turned out to be a real challenge because if you see the camera feed on the, um, in the center part, um, this is a, a camera pointing kind of on the side of the, uh, the beehive. Um, and it's really hard to pick out the bees from the grass uh, and everything behind it, the background. The background is very complex and even the grass, uh, you know, will sway in the, in the breeze and everything. And that in particular makes it a lot more challenging. If you had a security camera and a, you know, in a building, usually those are fixed and the background stays the same. Uh, so it makes it easier to pick out the motion. But here we've got, you know, all sorts of motion going on. So we ended up using a, uh, a, a new algorithm for us called Robust Principal Components, where we pre-process that video. And over on the left-hand side is you see the results of that. And those little white dots that you see moving are the bees. So what it does, that algorithm, uh, you know, that artificial intelligence algorithm says, okay, I can kind of see two different planes of motion. I see, you know, some, you know, the grass and everything blowing, but then I always see, you know, see these bees flying through. And so it separates those out um, and, and do that. Once we, once we have separated out what the bees are, then I go back and overlay it back onto the original video and I, um, and we can track them because we're watching them over time and I can catch each individual bee. And so you'll see them labeled and they'll, you'll see an ID number on them as well. And because I'm tracking them over time, then I can also say, well, what direction are they going and how fast are they going? And so we wanted to capture the bees, you know, how much activity there was coming and going from the beehive. And so uh, we call those arrivals and departures. Um, and then on the right-hand side is where we summarize all that up uh, and start to show in real time, you know, how many arrivals, how many departures, how much over time uh, that, you, uh, that you have. So that gives you a good idea of how you take something that's, you know, just a, a large amount of data in a video feed and distill it down to the interesting information of, well, what, what activity do we have coming, you know, bees coming and going. So that's what, uh, that's one area where we use the computer vision. Now, um, let me talk a little bit about the audio uh, in here, and I'm going to switch over to this dashboard. And but before I do that, um, what this is showing, this is a spectro audio spectrogram here, and um, you'll see. I'll play you some sound in a moment. Uh, but at the there's a line here near the bottom that's right at the 300 hertz uh, part of the spectrum. 
and that's just the normal beehive buzzing. And then you'll see um, this occasional thing that we call uh, chirping uh, that, that happens. And that, that's because of the queen bee. I'll talk about that in a moment. But let me list, let you listen to the sound so you can get an idea of what we're, uh, what we're talking about here. So this first one is, and be ready with your headsets, <laughs> um, is what the buzz of the beehive sounds like. <laughs> So that's that's what we call the the hum of the hive, and like I said, that's represented in this uh, on this dashboard. Let me get the right screen there um, by that line uh, right there at 300 hertz. So now we can we have a mechanism to uh, monitor and track how what that regular buzzing sound is in the hive and what the intensity is, and give us some ideas of the activity there. But then when um, the queen bee uh, starts to, uh, and I'll send you links for these articles too um, in the presentation. Um, one of the main events that the beekeepers are always interested in is the health of the queen bee. Um, and you know, the queen bees will sometimes uh, either die or a new queen bee will emerge. And um, when they do that, they make some different sounds as well. Uh, so let me play that real quick. <laughs> So, uh, so that's um, the pipe, what we call a piping or chirping sound, and that's captured in here on the spectrogram uh, by this little kind of comma-shaped sound, and that's the actual sound and then the harmonic. Because we've got this all now in, uh, in the data stream and we're processing it, and you know, I'm displaying it here on the, on the dashboard, uh, but we've also got the numeric values. You can even see where I, as I move my cursor, it shows them. Um, I can I can monitor that programmatically as well. And so now I get to the point where I can, if I start to hear this piping or chirping sound, I can send a message to the beekeepers and say, your queen bee is doing something unusual. You might want to go check it because that's something that they're very interested in. Who would want to sit around and listen to beehives buzzing all day? Um, so that's where we let the uh, artificial intelligence algorithm do that you know, monotonous monitoring, listening to bee buzzing, uh, and then just tell us when something interesting is going on. And then finally, uh, as part of the project, you know, we do have um, traditional sensors uh, in there as well. Um, these are is just a dashboard of the, um, let me just zoom that up a little bit, um, of, the, of the temperatures in there. Um, interesting thing with uh, beehives, when they're healthy, um, the temperature is usually between 92 to 96 degrees, um, or 98, I think it is. Um, and so what we're doing here is monitoring those temperatures to make sure they stay. That's the temperature they need to be so they can, uh, you know, have, have the baby bees grow up. Uh, over here on the right-hand side, we just monitor the outside temperature. So if one of these, if one of these um, temperature gauges goes out of that, uh, that range where it's a good temperature, we'll alert on that. And then down at the bottom here is a chart of uh, the weight. Uh, it's kind of sped up over time here, but as the bees come and go during the day and they bring, bring in more pollen and make honey, uh, the um, beehives will get heavier and heavier. Uh, so that's one thing the bee keepers want to do is monitor the weight. And, and occasionally, and we've seen this at our beehives, is if, if one beehive has got a real strong population and the other one uh, starts to get sick or is weak, the strong beehive will go just take the honey from the weak beehive. They don't bother to go out and get the pollen. They just like take the honey from the other one. And so that's some of the stuff that you're seeing here on that weight chart is where we have a, what we call a honey theft uh, there uh, to take, take that away. So that's, um, that gives you an idea of the data we're collecting and uh, what we're doing, um, you know, processing that data. Let me uh, take and throw it open to any questions uh, you want to re related to either the, um, uh, you know, the hardware or the analytics uh, that we're doing. Be glad to take any questions there. Uh, hi, Brad. This is Deepak here. Am I already? Hey. 
Yes, I can hear you. Uh, Thanks. I, I hear that you are using an edge server and we are also very much interested in it. I spoke with the Semtech and they pointed us to Chirpstick uh, to use on the edge uh, computing on the edge side. Uh, and we're looking into one more feature that would be a, a FOTA firmware update over the air. Uh, we did okay. some kind of research and we were thinking if you guys have achieved that and if the LBT base carrier has to be enabled uh, you know, to get to the make layer at the physical, from the physical layer, you know, it's something like that, you know, it's feasible, uh, achieved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what we do, so um, the, we, we work with a few of the different uh, gateway manufacturers and we kind of sit on a, you know, there's usually a, an IoT platform layer that uh, does what we call device management. Uh, mm -hmm. And then sometimes even what they call a data plane yeah. Um, and, and we usually sit on top of those and integrate with them. So, um, as far as us being able to do those, those type of updates and device management, we leverage the, um, the capabilities, uh, in those, in those platforms. We're more of a, like an application, uh, that runs in that environment, but we do have an interesting, um, aspect for us with the analytic models, because, um, if you're familiar with you know artificial intelligence and analytic models is you frequently have historical data um, and and you're always keep collecting that and keeping the the data around uh, you know for his, historical to capture more information um, and so occasionally you'll go back and what we call retrain uh, you re you know you run the algorithm again to relearn the model based on the the additional data that you have and so that's almost like a um, that's almost like a an update um, out there to the edge devices because now we have a, a new model and what you might see that in something like this is maybe you know we started this um, you know actually during more during the winter um, and got all the technology going and then as you know the bees became more active in the spring the we get more data that's more um, that's different from what we were collecting earlier so we have to, to update that does that help or Yes, it does. Thank you, Brad. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, no problem at all. Anyone else? Uh, any other questions before I move on here? We had one question in the chat, Brad, um, sure. from Matthew. Is this only applicable to bees? Um, uh, no, it's, uh, it turns out it was kind of interesting. Um, like I said, we, we did it because of our, we have a, you know, environmental sustainability initiative at SAS. And because the bees are under stress, uh, that was there. Um, it wasn't in. It wasn't really geared toward a commercial offering. But um, we do have a fairly new um, ag tech group, agriculture technology group, uh, at SAS. And as they learned about this, and they started talking to some of their different uh, customers, um, we we started to find places where we could apply this technology. Um, there's one that I've been involved with right now uh, regarding poultry farms. Uh, so when you think of it, if, you've, if you're from North Carolina and you're driving around, you see these big uh, poultry barns uh, out there. And it's just almost like a beehive inside there. There's just all sorts of chatter and activity and, and such. So we're almost taking a lot of this as is uh, for that. And there's some other livestock uh, type operations where you, we're almost can take this as is. Uh, to do it. Some of the different components then, I like the, the audio technology, that actually where we use that even more is in like manufacturing and machinery because um, you can put vibration sensors on uh, things like, you know, large pumps and motors and such. Um, but, you know, the, the operators will even tell you that, you know, they can just listen to it and see if it's, um, if it's, if it's behaving differently. And so you can, uh, take things like that audio processing and apply it even into things like, you know, manufacturing. Thanks, Brad. Those are all the questions I see right now. Great, great. Okay, well, I got just a, a couple more, uh, you know, details, uh, you know, kind of along the lines I was talking about earlier about how to, um, uh, you know, what it takes to put something like this, and then we'll talk a little bit about how to get started. Um, so when I mentioned the computer vision and the streaming video, 
Um, there's a couple different types of cameras. Um, first is just the you know, USB webcam, like what we're using for our, um, our, our Zoom call here and things like that. Uh, those actually work pretty good. They're, they're, they've gotten to be pretty good resolution. Um, and so we use those a lot and they're not expensive, you know, less than $50, uh, you know, type of thing. So you can definitely leverage that or look at the leverage that to start with. Um, the first part that is, um, you know, they're not as durable. They're made for using indoor and in an office environment. So you don't have that. Um, but then another type, if you need something better, uh, you know, a camera, whether it's, you know, better quality or more durable for industrial uses, um, there are a set of cameras uh, for that. And they make use of, sometimes they make use of, instead of a USB connection, of uh, a interface called Pylon. Um, there's a company that we work called, with called Bowsler, uh, who makes those. Um, there's also one of the um, gateway manufacturers, Advantech, that we work with, has one called the Neon J camera um, that's built into their gateway. And when I was talking about the gateways, I mentioned uh, the GPUs. Um, for the computer vision, the, the level of um, artificial intelligent models, they're called, um, uh, called deep neural networks. Um, they pre they need a GPU to really process because they, they do so many floating point calculations. Uh, a regular CPU doesn't have the horsepower. So that's where our folks at NVIDIA and stuff have really <laughs> got a whole new market for them. And like this Advantech camera here has a NVIDIA GPU built into it. Um, let's see, this, the streaming audio is interesting. Once again, uh, that's just a USB microphone. We bought it off uh, Amazon. Uh, it was like a lapel microphone. Uh, and we just stuck it inside the beehive. The microphone itself only cost, um, like, you know, $15, uh, or so. Uh, and now, you know, so now you get your beekeepers, <laughs> uh, they get the bee suit on, open it up, stick it in there, and then we just leave it in there. And they, they put a little, um, area around it so the screen around it so the bees wouldn't put put honey all in it um, and that turned out to work out uh, work out great and then you know we're just using some of the standard audio drivers in Linux uh, to get that audio stream into a, a data format a digital format that we can then um, process uh, in our software uh, and then one other one I mentioned about the um, the the weight and temperature and everything uh, the one interesting aspect with that is, in particular, the temperature and the, um, the it's the temperature inside the hive. Remember, I was mentioning you know it needs to be between 92 and 96 uh, degrees. Um, and so there's some of the beekeepers have um, their companies have produced uh, a little temperature sensor. We work with a uh, work with a couple of them, and you it, it's a Bluetooth device. Uh, and it runs off a battery and you stick it in there. You kind of see this in some other areas now where it's, it's made to be disposable, essentially. You know, you put it in there, it's low cost, $30 or something like that. You put it inside the beehive, it runs for a year or two until that battery runs out and then you just toss it. Um, so, uh, so th that's how that, that works versus a regular you know, temperature sensor. Um, now, because it needs such low energy, because you don't want to run that battery down, um, there's part of the Bluetooth um, uh, low energy protocol is this thing called an advertising beacon. And it's basically the, you know, the little Bluetooth thing, it'll just send out a signal. I'm trying to think of ours are every few seconds or something, maybe once a second even, um, that just says, I'm here, I'm, you know, here I am, here I am. But with that little beacon signal, you can actually put a very small data payload on there. And so in our case, it's the temperature. So it's saying, I'm here, oh, and it's 93 degrees. I'm here, oh, and it's 94 degrees. Um, and it just pops that out. So it's not a, um, it's not like there's any kind of bi-directional uh, um, communication there. It's just the, the little beacon sending its stuff out and then, you know, we're sitting there with a uh, Bluetooth receiver listening for it. That's how that works. So it's interesting, uh, you know, interesting little details on, on how those work. Um, 
I also thought I'd talk some about the, the network setup uh, because um, you kind of see, because we're out at the beehives and beehives are in remote locations, uh, but then we're handling a lot of data and doing a lot of processing, um, the network is not your standard uh, thing. And luckily, you know, with, with Riot, and we've got a lot of people real experience in, in um, wireless communication. So uh, it's not as new for some of you all. But, um, you know, what we ended up doing is in that enclosure out there, um, you basically set up a, a little local network. Um, and that's what handles you know, either the wired connections uh, from like the microphones or the Bluetooth connections with the sensors. Oh yeah, um, a couple of the companies we work with on those Bluetooth sensors is uh, one's called Broodminder, uh, another one called B Solution. Um, and they're, they're both regional here. Um, so we have that, uh, we have that kind of um, local network going. And then we do um, uh, a, a cellular network to connect back to the back to the cloud, and that's doing. Um, you know, we're we're using AT and T uh, through that. I'm really excited about as you know, 5G becomes um, more uh, more prevalent. We'll be able to take advantage of that. I got a couple of details in here that are SaaS specific, um, just for our internal uh, technical people on how we got part of became part of the cellular plan that we have at SaaS um, and do that. And then I had to. I got a little thing here. I'll just mention it to you so you know to look for it. Uh, you know, IP addresses normally on wireless stuff, it's DHCP. And so it's, a, you know, dynamic addresses that come and go. And for us to get started, we want it, we set up static IP addresses just so we could keep those connected a little bit easier. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, the whole motivation for doing uh, the edge computing is so that we can um, do the processing on the edge and uh, not have to use the cellular as much. But the problem is, while we were getting started, uh, we needed to get all that video and audio back. So we, at the beginning, our cellular usage is very high, fairly high. Uh, but now that it's up and running, we've got enough to train the models. It's it's down. Um, and then that, some of those are some. Uh, uh, some specifics to our SAS IT implementation. We have changed it over to use MQTT as the messaging bus between the edge and the and the cloud. Uh, we're, initially, we're using a, a different you know, proprietary technology, but um, I, I like to use MQTT. We use Kafka a lot uh, in projects as well. MQTT is a little bit lighter weight. So, um, so that's basically what we have uh, with the project. Um, like I said, the main objective for us was to take, you know, all the different IRT, different types of IRT uh, data sources that we can, that we have and use our different algorithms on all those different ones. Uh, you'll see, I've got a couple uh, papers that some of my teammates uh, put together talking about more details. Most of these are, um, on the details on the analytics side. Um, so if you want to learn more about the algorithms, I can answer questions on those, um, or you can uh, check those papers. And I think we'll make the, we'll be making the uh, presentation available uh, that you can, can get those. So I appreciate it. And uh, if there's any other questions here before we finish up, I'd be glad to take them. Thanks so much, Brad. I see a couple in the chat box that I'll read out. But again, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat box or you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask the question yourself if you're comfortable. Um, question here from Joseph, which cellular modem are you using? Um, let's see, it's, it's one that is built into the gateway that we had. So I really don't have more information than that. There's there was um, a couple Advantech gateways that we used, and um, so I, yeah, I don't I don't have any more details of like what the you know what the modem chip is or anything like that. If that's what what you're asking, but um, the gateway there was a Trek 570 gateway, and uh, and then they also have I still have I have one sitting on my desk over here somewhere. Um, one of their wireless routers at Advantech, and you could could look up the spec sheet on that if you need more details or I can I can send feel free to send it to them and I'll send you the model numbers and we can find it. 
Thanks, Brian. A question from Alwyn here. Any intent to commercialize this? Um, I think the commercializing it will come in some of those other applications. Um, right now, we, we didn't really um, worry too much about the cost of the solution as we were doing it because it was mostly a research project. And um, for, for um, beehives, the cost is probably still uh, is probably still too high to really be implemented uh, much. Uh, and just to give you, I mean, just the hardware itself was a few thousand dollars for those gateways and, and things. Some of the pieces were cheap, but some of them, you know, were 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 more expensive. Um, but as we get into these commercial livestock type applications, uh, they're definitely, you know, that's well within the budget uh, that that they would plan to spend on something like that. So yeah, the commercialization for us is is really coming more from that commercial uh, livestock. And as we're working with different beekeepers. Um, you know, we're in that way, case is almost like what, you know, when Lee was talking earlier, we're kind of just becoming part, we're part of the community there and we contribute what we can and other people are contributing. And so maybe collectively we get something that's a little bit more uh, feasible for, for beekeepers. Thanks, Brad. Question from Matthew here. What do you mean by being slash living off the grid is achievable and what is the network travel distance? Um, repeat part of that is it was what is the what makes the say that again I'm sorry I didn't yeah no worries oh. what do you mean by being living off the grid is achievable and what is the network travel distance mm -hmm. okay okay yeah um, I guess living off the grid being achievable is um, mostly for us uh, was first of all the cellular connection which we'll talk about in, in a second but then the uh, the power consumption um, and getting the power consumption low enough that uh, we can just run it on a um, uh, you know solar uh, panel uh, essentially. Um, one good thing about the bees is uh, they they do uh, you know sleep at night pretty much or they're quiet at night. They're most their activities during the day, um, and also uh, in the rain <laughs> they they usually stay around the beehive. Um, so we can you know so the power consumption for what we're doing out there is it, it is possible to you know get to a, a solar type setup and then the uh, the range on it um, is since we're using cellular uh, you know it's in the in the order of you know a couple miles or something normally and a lot of beehives are you know in places where you can have where there is some cellular coverage um, you know occasionally you get into very rural agriculture places and and they're not but um, a lot of a lot of places are uh, where there's there's pretty good there's the cellular coverage is good enough I'll say. Thanks, Brad. All in here wants to know: Are you able to detect and predict swarming? Um, <clears throat> that is once uh, something that our our beekeepers are are studying. They um, they think they that we can because now that we're getting some of that data, in particular the sound data. Uh, but even the weight data, they're starting to see, um, you know, up, uh, up until, you know, like a day or so, or, you know, at least uh, 12 hours or so ahead of time, you can start to cha tell a, a change in the, in the bees and just for everybody and what swarming is. So occasionally the queen bee will leave the beehive and start to take off and all the other bees follow her. <laughs> And um, and that's called a swarm. And the, for the beekeepers themselves, they don't want to lose the queen bee. Um, and so if it's if it's either going to swarm or is starting to swarm, they'll go out there and try to find the queen bee and bring it back to the hive. Uh, some of my beekeeper friends do this. I'm like, that is just crazy. Um, and uh, in fact, we had that happen at SAS. But yes, that is a very important thing because. Uh, as you were probably alluding to there, I mean, if this is out in a remote location and you only go by and check it every few days, it's not unusual for the, the queen to leave and the swarm take off and you go out there and there's just an empty hive there. And it's like, well, what happened? Uh, so yeah, we, um, we, we haven't activated that completely yet, but we, we do from the, the data that we're seeing, we do think we could you know, get some notification there. Thanks so much, Brad. Those are all the questions I'm seeing right now. Um, 
you mentioned being able to contact your brand. What's the best way for people to reach you? Um, well, I, uh, um, LinkedIn is good. Um, I saw a couple of people uh, hit me on LinkedIn already there. That's, that's, uh, that's a good one. Uh, you can send an um, email as well. It's uh, pretty easy, brad.cleanse at sass.com. Uh, those are probably the, the two best. Great, and I'll put that in the oh, chat box for everyone. And of course, at any riot events, Karen. Sorry, I was on mute. That's, a, that's right, Brad. Yeah. Uh, can't wait to get back in person for those uh, in-person riot events. And I, I see quite a few riot sponsors on the day. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Um, thanks so much, Brad. Really appreciate okay. you being here. Um, again, this, this is being recorded. We posted a riot's YouTube channel and meetup pages. Um, and please do reach out to Brad. He's a great resource um, to our community. So we're, we're very thankful to have him here. Thanks again, Brad. All right. Very good. Well, it was really good to see everybody. Thank you, Brad. Good to see you again. Yeah, sure enough. Okay. Thanks. Take care, everyone.